cloud. All right, so we're recording this so that anybody who couldn't make it tonight can view it later. We would like this forum to be interactive and formal, uh, informal, that is. So um, we look forward to your questions. We're going to start with a few words from each candidate and then move to questions and answers. And to ask a question, I'll ask that you either raise your hand, and you can do that by clicking on the word participant down below. And when you do that, you'll wind up with a, a panel that opens up. And the very bottom of it is there ought to be a raise hand somewhere. I guess it's, it's off to the it's off to the left. Yeah, exactly. Basically, if you, if you put any icon over your over your little window, I'll see it and I'll I'll take note. And Stevie Tarkington has just joined us. Welcome, Stevie. Um, so, so when you raise your hand, I'll call your name so you can ask your question. If you, if you prefer, you can type your question into the chat box and I can read it out loud either way. And let's see. So we ask that you go ahead and mute yourself to minimize the background noise. And now we'll turn to asking each candidate to say a few words. So let's get started with Tracy. Tracy. Um, could you tell us something about yourself and why you're running for city council? Let's start with that. Okay, well, thank you for taking the time to be here tonight. So I've met some of you, um, but in case you haven't met me, my name is Tracy Martinez and I'm very excited to be running for city council. I'm a registered nurse and I'm a healthcare director. My husband and I moved to Delmore in 2012. We fell in love with the beauty of this small, unique seaside village. I thought it was amazing how you could be almost anywhere in town and get views of the ocean. But I also think it's quite unique with the Torrey Pines and bluffs and lagoons. So it's just a beautiful place and a very gorgeous place with a high quality of life. I think this election is probably one of the most important for Delmore's future. Things are moving very fast and there's a lot of things facing us. I think there's a big distinction between myself and, and Dave and three of the other candidates for sure on how they see the future of Del Mar versus how we see the future of Del Mar. I am dedicated to protecting the community plan um, and preventing massive developments. Once we do that, we have that forever. It's really important. It's one of the things that we can't do over and go back. I do think that Del Mar faces a lot of challenges. Obviously, the financial challenges because of the hard impact of COVID. So I think we, we are fiscally going to need, need to be very smart and savvy. I also think that um, in addition to that, but also with the topic of finances, we need to really focus on creating a more vibrant downtown. And I know that's been said in the past for many years, but I truly believe it, it's something that we need to do. But it's going to take open-mindedness and some flexibility. I also believe that, um, as I discussed, the potential for overdevelopment, particularly when we're talking about our affordable housing mandate, is going to be really challenging, and we need to be very watchful of this. And really, I ran because I, I wanted to see a change in dynamics on the council, and I want to really listen to the residents um, with an open mind and not a preconceived decision on how, I'm how I would vote on any one issue. So I hope to bring some newness um, to the council and participate in protecting this city that we love. Great, thank you, Tracy. Um, Dave, same question to you. Yeah, right. Tell us a bit about yourself and why you're running for city council. Well, first of all, thank you, Terry, for hosting this. For Tracy, thank you for uh, working with me on this campaign. And thank you for everybody who's joining. I'm very, uh, Pleased to see so many faces. Um, you know, some obviously some of the, you have met me before, and, and some of you have not. And uh, I have been honored to uh, serve you for the last four years, and from 1996 to 2008. You know, we've done a whole lot of work during that time, and uh, you know, at this point, the city is in crisis, uh, specifically with. COVID-19 and the amount of the financial crisis that we have. And I see where the, the city needs to have experienced leadership to get us through this next couple of years because it's gonna to be tough until the uh, fairgrounds starts coming back up to full, full speed because that's 50% of our sales tax. 
Um, the other reason I'm running is because I want to ensure that the city is not overdeveloped. Um, I am absolutely terrified to have a council that um, where a majority of the people would support uh, Maris, a major project like Marisol up on the North Bluff. And they would, if uh, four people get, if three people get elected, they will join a super majority and uh, be able to basically make zone changes and um, all sorts of other changes without having a check on that because they will have four votes to be able to make those changes. And uh, as Tracy alluded to, once you develop something, it doesn't go back. And it's essential that we have that uh, we have that check on the overdevelopment. Yep, some other things are, and I know some people are on here, they're very worried about managed retreat. And that's something that we want to make sure the Coastal Commission does not turn around and demand that we put the managed retreat in our sea level rise adaptation plan. Um, I know the mills are always worried about uh, everybody right now. Um, um, every, Dave, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but Tracy's electricity just went out completely in their block. So really? don't have Tracy anymore. Well, um, and, I, and I noticed that we lost a few other people too. So we may be having well, an event in Del Mar. <laughs> somebody's yeah. using too much. Well, obviously everybody on the Zoom is using way too much electricity. <laughs> so, so, is it, Tell Tracy, um, <laughs> drive on over to my house and she can join my other laptop. Exactly. <laughs> so maybe Tracy right. will be here in five minutes or so. Do you Just want me to send her a text or something inviting her to do that? I have her. Oh, already. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, so let me, you know, I know the, the mills um, are always worried about infrastructure and making sure the roads are paved and, and that we need to continue to do that. Um, we can't just uh, let COVID turn around and say, well, we're going to stop everything that's essential that we do have those services and provide those. And as, as we're getting out of COVID, we need to aggressively work on infrastructure. So, um, you know, again, I, I would really be honored to continue to serve you for the next four years. And, uh, you know, as you all know, I sit at the farmer's market once a month, listening to your concerns. And I walk through town a whole lot, jog on the beach and enjoy chatting with everybody. Right These days, I'm not doing a whole lot of chatting. I'm self-isolated, but uh, once we're out of COVID, I will be back in, in action, shall we say, trying to make sure that I understand what everybody's needs in, are in town rather than just a few people. So, so thank you, Dave, for those opening words. Um, while we wait for Tracy to zip over here and she can socially distance on our other computer. Um, do we have any initial questions that someone would like to ask? How do, how do you uh, how do you interrupt? John Morris, yeah, you can if you raise your hand and wave like that, I'm gonna see you. And okay. other you know otherwise there's there should be a raise hand icon down at the bottom on well, the Well, there probably is, but John Morse can't figure that out right now. Not a problem. So I have everybody in gallery mode and I'm seeing you here. And so. by the way, we're on battery, so the electricity is irrelevant. I'm, I'm sure they have enough juice in their laptops to continue, Great. but maybe not. Anyway, Good. we Karen and I just got finished with the video from last week. So we're up to date on this five candidates to six, uh, six six candidates six candidates so we 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 learned a lot and it was a very interesting deficient in not doing this earlier but it seems to me that the the reason we're here tonight is to figure out what are the key issues to separate you and tracy from the other four people and it seems from our education this evening that there are some significant differences between you two or among you two and the other four. Uh, number one, the North Bluff, the whole Marisol thing should not be forgotten. And that needs to be played up as we get closer to the election. Uh, number two, your views on the short-term rental seem to vary from the other, at least three, maybe four. And the, forgive me for not doing the RINA, the, the RHNA, uh, density issue of do we accept the number and if so where does it go uh, it seems that those are the three issues 
to my view, looking at the video tonight, that separates you and Tracy from the other three. Everybody agrees manage retreat is probably not something to beat the drum about because all six of you uh, have agreed that that's not, in, that's not on the table. Uh, Karen and I specifically would like some more information on this, the Measure Q funds and how it was uh, uh, distributed and where, uh, where the controversy is on how to deal with the residuals of Me Measure Q, if that becomes a campaign issue. But I think we should use this evening to <clears throat> reinforce how you separate yourselves from the other four. And you might tell us which of the other four might be the most compatible one that you could work with if all goes well. That's my little spiel. Thank you. Appreciate it, John. Um, basically, I think the major difference between um, Tracy and I and the other four candidates is how to deal with short-term rentals. Yes. And um, basically three candidates have lined up to say they would love to sue the Coastal Commission to uh, basically ban short-term rentals. Um, the 28-7 concept is uh, for all intents and purposes a ban on short-term rentals and that's what the, uh, the uh, Coastal Commission sees that. And uh, the coast, we, we did, Sue over my objection, the Coastal Commission, and then initially uh, over my objection, the uh, council decided to appeal that decision, and uh, so basically we, uh, you know, we lost that. The judge ruled that uh, the application had expired, and that uh, the the application was no longer valid. So. Three of the candidates want to go back to the Coastal Commission, go to 28-7 and say, and get the Coastal Commission to reject that. Then take them to court and see if a judge will um, determine whether or not the Coastal Commission has the ability to tell cities how to uh, regulate short-term rentals. And they, this group of people believe that they can win that in court. Um, my take on it is the uh, Coastal Commission has never lost a, a battle in court, except when they did some takings of some property. And uh, I think it would be very difficult to get a court to agree uh, that some city has more power than the, uh, than the Coastal Commission. So um, I think that's a major difference. The other major difference is, is what you talked about was the, uh, basically what types of numbers we need to provide for housing. And we are allocated 163 houses. We have to build 163 houses in this next housing element. About 113 of them have to be uh, affordable. And the only way we're gonna build that is if it's on the fairgrounds. And the way I'm looking at this is that it's a state issue. The state's created the problem for us. And there's this property over on the fairgrounds and they should cut belly up to the bar and help us solve this problem. We have, uh, you know, I've personally chatted with our state senator, Tony Atkins, about this and her legislative assistant, Deanna Spain, and they both agree that that is exactly what should happen. And we just need to start pushing that so that we can get affordable housing. And, you know, absolutely, we need affordable housing. It isn't something we're trying to uh, not have. And uh, Tracy, why don't you talk a little bit more about affordable housing because this is one of your key issues as you were vice chair of the ad hoc committee to, on the sixth element. So, so I've set up the computer for Tracy to join us. She's not here yet. Oh, she's not here, okay. Well, basically the, the bottom line is, um, you know, there's a way that we can sprinkle affordable housing all throughout the city. And uh, is that Tracy on the line now? They get on next door and they put out. So, you know, we can sprinkle it on using uh, uh, accessory dwelling units and uh, tiny houses in certain spots and basically have it all throughout the, uh, the city rather than doing a major development up on North Bluff or in the North Commercial area, you know, and overdevelop those areas which are very sensitive in terms of the, uh, the environment. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody today and the North Bluff, you know, there's some caves at the, yeah. at the West End 
And unless you, the only place you can really develop the North Bluff is on the east side, not, not the west side, not the south side. Um, and obviously we don't want to have that look like uh, Solana Beach the, uh, uh, and Sierra and the Del Mar um, Beach Club, et cetera. So we, we need to make sure that we are protecting our environment. Um, and I think, you know, so I think those are some of the major, major differences. If I may ask a question. Why don't that we let's see if somebody else can ask a question, John, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, so do we have other questions? I think Tim Mills does. Thank you. Yeah, John brought it up, so I'm going to uh, piggyback on his uh, question. And uh, I, I just need a little background on the major, uh, major Q fund. Right. I'm curious how much has been raised to date and how much has been borrowed yeah. and what arrangements have been made for the repayment. Okay, so about $100,000 has been borrowed from Measure Q. Um, most of the money has been spent uh, so far on doing the downtown streetscape. Huh. And um, basic, you know, so it's a couple million dollars have been, were used on the downtown streetscape. Um, you know, basically when the budget came and I refused to pa pass the budget unless the council would agree that the Measure Q money had to be repaid, initially, you know, had to be repaid, and also the pension reserves had to be fully funded. Um, otherwise, uh, I wasn't going to pass the budget, and the council thought it was absolutely essential that we uh, have a consensus on the budget. And, and basically, again, Terry and I basically held firm until they agreed that we would bring back a resolution that says those come first. Staff is not added. Um, you know, we, we bring the staff up to full, um, they get to work full time and be paid full time, but no staff is added until we have the reserves and Measure Q repaid. And the concept is, you know, that we should be able to fund that and start a restart the undergrounding design, mm. which is, um, you know, Ann and, and Gill, that's in your area, in mm. Ariba, and then up, uh, in actually Terry's area um, towards the south, you know, the South Bluff area. Yeah, and right on Stafford Park with Staber, yep. Yeah, so Tracy, welcome back. Yeah, so Tracy's back with us. Say hello. <laughs> so let's see, so let's try this. We're gonna do a little experiment here first. Tracy, you wanna say hello? Um, well, glad to be back. Very, very good, can they hear you? So. Tracy's on mute, so she's probably on your foot, on your... Uh... Yeah, so what I'm going to do is take my laptop into the back room. Tracy's here in the kitchen. We're socially distant. And then, um, so, so I'll, let, I'll, I'll mute myself, put my, uh, stop my video. I'll go in the back room. And John, uh, Dr. Morse, perhaps you could repeat your question in short form for, um, for Tracy to answer. Oh, the question was relating to my original issue. Julie's on here. Um, she's listening. She's listening. Okay. There Sorry about that. I first have to say, what are the odds of that happening? It's crazy. <laughs> so I apologize and uh, I got here as quickly as I could. Um, so I too believe that the funds from Measure Q should be paid back before any other spending. And I think the undergrounding utilities is important, not just from aesthetics, but most importantly, from a fire risk. So, um, you know, if, if that doesn't happen, it's really hard to get citizens to trust that what they voted for is actually going to occur. So I think for trust and importance of, um, of building the money back and the safety need for undergrounding is really important. You're gonna let this go? You're gonna let this go? <laughs> is your, your position on Measure Q, your and Dave's, different from the other candidates? I don't, I don't think it's probably she really is. <laughs> It's probably the same. It's just, uh, you know, um, the, the question, you know, 
I didn't feel the, the, the majority of the council who support these other guys, um, you know, saw the urgency of getting Measure Q pay, repaid. That's all. And uh, so I, you know, I, everybody obviously wants to repay Measure Q and get the undergrounding going. I mean, that's like absolutely essential for the, for the city. So one of the other questions John asked was about, uh, and, I, and I let you, would like you, Tracy, to talk about this is um, affordable housing and uh, what you've learned about what we can do about affordable housing and, and how we're going to meet our 163 number for the sixth cycle. So Dave, I apologize. I didn't have volume. If you could just repeat the first part of that. Yes, so uh, John Morris asked about affordable housing and how we can meet our allocation of 163 units that we need to do over the next eight years. Right. Well, that's a, uh, there's a, a lot to that question, John, and I'm really glad you asked it. It is a very difficult feat to do what we need to do with the numbers that we were assigned from SANDAG. We need to come up with 101 low and very low affordable housing units which is really challenging because if you do the new the, if you looked at property that would need to have new development to be able to have 101 units, for instance, there really isn't enough land in, in the city. We could rezone the North Bluff, the South Bluff, downtown, North Commercial, we still come up short. For a long time, I have always really advocated for um, validating our numbers. As you probably know, that 2,000 of our job, of the jobs that were assigned to us for affordable housing um, RENA numbers are based on the fairgrounds, part-time transient jobs. So that's an issue first and foremost, because we don't have control over the fairgrounds, yet they have over 300 acres where they could provide some affordable housing. And then secondly, 2,400 jobs in Del Mar um, is what uh, Sandag has said that we have. Those jobs to this, this day right now have never been validated. So I think it's, uh, it's hard for me to wrap my head around non-validated numbers um, and, and not challenge that. So I think that, that we really need to challenge these numbers because when you really look at a, at a blueprint on what we would need to do to be able to fill this mandate, it's really not possible. Having said that, um, the affordable housing committee that I worked on uh, as vice chair have come up with some very, uh, I think, innovative ways to be able to have more affordable housing in Del Mar um, and, and really staying true to our community plan and not turning the keys over of our city to developers to do. So it's, it, there's really two parts to it. I think that some of the things that we've learned late, lately over the last few weeks um, as we learn more from the staff is that this is going to be a very, very, very difficult um, task unless we challenge the numbers that were, that were assigned to us. Thank you, Terry and, and Tracy. Maybe clarify one thing. The, the number seems to be a variable. It may be inflated and it may not be realistic, but if we were to pick a realistic number of real jobs that we had to provide for, the real jobs that may exist in Del Mar. Maybe the number is somewhere between 20 and 80, I don't know. Where would we begin to put the units if we didn't use the North Circle commercial area and we didn't revert back to the North Bluff and we didn't have control over the fairgrounds if we had to produce 20 to 80 units somewhere in the city, where would we begin to think about where those units would go? Since there's not a lot of land to, to start with and it's way overpriced for affordable housing for somebody who doesn't know anything about real estate, but it's not realistic to think that we could do that. So even if the number were lower, what's your idea where we might start to think about where those I don't units know if it's, they could hear us or not. So um, there is an executive summary that the, the task force put forth that I would really uh, recommend everybody read. But what we did was we looked at um, city owned properties to see where we could put some affordable units. 
but also in our executive summary, it did incorporate the fairgrounds coming to the table and, and meeting us halfway as well. So if you look at it, there's some tiny homes that could be put on 28th Street. There's some uh, parcels of land that are owned by the city that could be developed into triplex or fourplexes. Um, obviously, ADUs are going to account for some of those because people have developed ADUs. We believe that um, some um, accessory units downtown in existing uh, businesses would be another viable solution to some affordable housing. Right now, they're limited to one, but some of those um, businesses could, uh, could have more than one uh, unit above them. So these are just multiple innovative ways. Um, and, and so, yes, we do need the help of the fairgrounds. That goes without saying. Um, but through multiple areas of affordable housing could be put with ADUs, public, or I'm sorry, city-owned property. Um, and so we could pick up units throughout the city that way. Would you like to add some thoughts to that? Were you, I, I miss, were you asking me, Terry? Yeah, whether you wanted to expand. No, I think, you know, I, I already expanded on it. So let's get to, get to another question. Okay, great. So Jerry Jacobs is posing the question. Um, he points out that, yes, all six candidates have said they're against managed retreat, um, but three of them haven't said that they would withdraw the LCPA if the Coastal Commission insists on making changes. Um, so in fact, that part of the issue is still there. Dave, what's your view on how do we deal with the Coastal Commission and what do we do if they keep insisting on managed retreat? Well, right now, um, our sea level rise adaptation plan is part of our community plan. And that is what the, uh, the mandate is from the state that your community plan be updated with a sea, uh, sea level rise adaptation plan. Uh, the Coastal Commission, it would be nice if we could get them to, uh, to uh, approve our LCPA. Um, but, you know, basically my position is if they want to do managed retreat or, you know, they've made some changes that they've asked for that, that uh, don't say managed retreat, but basically make it look like we would have to do managed retreat. I think we have to withdraw the application and tell the Coastal Commission, sorry, it's in our com community plan and that's where it's going to stay. No. And, and until you uh, are willing to work with us um, based upon what we've devised. And, you know, again, Laura, you were on that committee. Uh, Ter Terry, you were on, you chaired that committee. Uh, the citizens of Del Mar really worked hard on this to ensure that we had a local coastal plan amendment that made, that uh, protected the city um, and had ways for us to uh, continually uh, provide for sea level adaptation. Um, you know, again, the biggest problem is not the front row of houses. And that's where the Coastal Commission gets all tied up in knots. They think the front row of houses is, is, is going to, are going to be wiped out by sea level rise adaptation. The real problem ultimately is the rivers of rain that will drop on the San Diego River and flood out um, the fairgrounds and the area, you know, our low-lying areas. Um, and the, the uh, front row of houses with their seawalls basically are going to protect uh, all the rest of the houses from any type of wave activity. So I think, you know, Terry and I, when, when, we, uh, when this came to the uh, council, have, have been very strong about this. And we need, you know, that's one of the reasons I want Tracy on this council, is so that we have a majority of the council rather than Terry and I being in the minority. Great, thanks. Um, we have a few questions that have come into the chat room and a few people want to actually ask their question as opposed to me reading it. So Jazz hand is, is raised and Jean wants to ask about scenic views and Steve Tarkington would like to ask about the Shores property. And then Ellen O'Neill is gonna wanna circle back to city owned properties. So let's just take that in order. Jazz, your hand was up first. And you'll have to, you'll have to unmute yourself, Jazz.
Okay, Jazz. Okay, okay here we go. Sorry. So my question has to do with um, the rezone of the downtown commercial that is being proposed in the current housing element that staff have presented uh, to current council, but that's going to be uh, one of their key requirements they're saying to uh, address this affordable housing. And of course, when you rezone uh, any area now, it's going to be required by the state that it's 20 residential units per acre. And, you know, Proposition J uh, was defeated, which I think had a similar plan. I know the other candidates are in favor um, of this because they have said it will bring vibrancy to downtown. How do you both feel about this? Well, I'll start, Dave, if that's okay with you. Please. I think that if you could just close your eyes for a second and think about 20 units per acre on either side, both the west and the east side of downtown, I think it would look more like Mission Valley. And I think we need to be cautious. Um, so, you know, I, I wouldn't support that. I think we need to find other solutions. Again, I think we also need to go back and uh, and challenge our numbers. But having said that, Jazz, I really don't think most people, as you said, overwhelmingly voted against Jay. Um, this would be the same thing except on steroids. So I think that um, that's not a viable solution. I, again, do not think it represents the vast majority of residents and how they want the downtown area to look. So um, I would agree with Tr Tracy, um, basically. 20 units per acre um, in the downtown area just does not make sense. Uh, there are areas where we could add more residential. I mean, if you look um, down the east side, there's plenty of places where there are two-story buildings where the second story build, second story could become uh, residential without affecting the commercial down below. Um, there's also places on the uh, west side where they would be off the alley and they could be in the back of the commercial areas and those could be residential. Um, you know, so there is possibility to have residential. The problem is if we change the zone and a majority of the council is not Tracy, Terry and I, then all of a sudden we will get a 20 unit per acre zone and uh, all of a sudden that will allow two stories all throughout the, uh, the west side of Camino del Mar and you know, I see Karen Powell's on the, on, on the uh, Zoom. And, you know, basically one of the things that she wanted and she didn't like about 941 was the fact that her view of the, of the, uh, of the community was just totally wiped out by 941. And I think, you know, people want to have views of the community. They, you know, a scenic view is not just a scenic view of a tree or, a, uh, or the ocean. It's a scenic view and, and there's all sorts of different uh, measures for scenic views. And I think, you know, one of the major things, why do people gravitate to, da to Del Mar? It's because of the quaintness, the, the uniqueness of Del Mar. There's nowhere like Del Mar and anywhere else in the world. And we, uh, we need to protect that. If we don't, you know, once it gets developed, it's not coming back. Terry, I just wanted to share a quick story. Um, why I feel so adamant about this. For years, I lived in Manhattan Beach, which is a, a town just um, north of downtown LA. Beautiful beach community. Um, and over the course of the years that I lived there, they started to develop um, three-story homes um, and, and businesses as well. And one thing I remember being very saddened is that you could be literally one block above the, the strand and you could not even know the ocean was there. Um, and so, and also you'd get shade a lot part of the time because you had all these massive buildings and it completely changed the character of the town. And one of the things that I found so um, wonderful about Del Mar is you can walk almost anywhere in town, whether you're the hills or whether you're on the um, Camino Del Mar and you get these beautiful breezes, the sound of the ocean and the views of the ocean. Again, I agree with Dave, that's what makes us unique. And so to rezone that completely, I think, could be just devastating to the character of our town. Great. Thank you for that, that story, Tracy. I mean, it, it's the contrast. You know, I myself, you know, like you, when I first came to Del Mar, I just found it so quaint and so wonderful. And, you know, 
my house has an 18 inch wide window with an ocean view, a due west ocean view. And I value that ocean view so much. So I'm gonna ask Gene to ask his question about scenic views. Gene Switch. Hey, sw uh, Swift Terry. Uh, ah, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Well, I am. Uh, <laughs> I'm extremely honored to to back both David and Tracy, um, and you too, Terry. I think the three of you will make a, a fantastic <laughs> um, uh, addition to our city council, and I, I absolutely appreciate your views. All right. So, and to talk about views, I guess that's a good segue. Um, Del Mar is unique. It's extremely unique. Um, the Torrey Pines are, are magnificent. Uh, and our ocean views, uh, I have a view that's going away actually. So I'm personally affected by some of this stuff. My neighbors have been personally affected by some of this stuff. And it's not the Torrey Pines that are the issues. All right, these Tories, um, I love them. And they actually make a nice view of being a Tory and the ocean kind of come together. It's these, it's these evasive species that have come to Del Mar that have grown like Jack and the Beanstalk that are the problem. And they are destroying, they are absolutely destroying that uniqueness about Del Mar. I mean, a eucalyptus tree, uh, that's, th that's not part of Del Mar. It's not part of the city logo. It's, um, and they're dangerous. So I, I do have a, really bad uh, bad experiences with these eucalyptus trees so um tracy i have talked to dave many times uh and and i this is a distinguishing thing on your literature you actually call out the scenic views and i've personally my neighbor my 94 year old neighbor the magulius has probably the one of the worst possible cases in del mar's history of how whacked I'm sorry to use that word, but oh. whacked our scenic view ordinance is. Uh, Dave has personally told me, you know, that ordinance was never meant to pit neighbor against neighbor. And it's actually just being used as a destructive force um, from one neighbor to another. Okay, so, so Gene, let's hear, um, let's hear okay. from Tracy. Tracy I and I so. have talked quite a bit about this, including the Magulias's. Tracy? Yeah, Jean, thank you for that. That's really that uh, case study that you presented was really uh, eye opener for me. I think that it should be, um, that views should be protected. But what also was interesting to me and what I learned is it's very expensive to get your view back. I think it's ridiculously expensive. And also there's really no incentive for a neighbor to cooperate. And there's nothing really punitive for that neighbor if they don't cooperate. So I think the view ordinance needs to be uh, looked at, rewritten. Uh, I'd love, I would have community input in this, but I think that it is very important to protect views. Um, I too lo love the Torrey Pines. I actually paid for my neighbor who has a Torrey Pine in front of me to have the Torrey Pine laced. So I have this beautiful Torrey Pine with a little bit of an ocean view coming through. So there are workable ways, but if you have a neighbor that is not um, neighborly, I think that it can be a big issue. And I think the ordinance needs to be more protective of the person whose view is being blocked. And we need to have it written so there's a fairly swift resolution to get the view back. And it shouldn't be extraordinarily expensive. I think that that's insane. I also don't, I would like to understand how the staff can spend 91 hours on one view ordinance complaint. I think oh. that would be the justification for the high fee, but I think the fee is ridiculous and that needs to be reduced. And I think there needs to be a um, clear blueprint on how there could be resolution so that resident can get their view back. All right, so thank Jean, you, Tracy. you have a little bit of a follow-up question. You wanna keep yeah, it so a little let short? Me just, let me just uh, chime in here. Yeah, go uh, ahead, We, we um, passed that view ordinance after a whole lot of citizens work on that. And that was the best we could do at that time. Now that we've had some history on this, it is time probably to go back, look at it, and uh, see how it can be tweaked so that it it does uh, continue to maintain what we uh, the initial idea was, is to ensure that trees um, were grown properly and did not um, reduce people's scenic views. 
I agree with you too, Jean. Eucalyptus trees are one of the worst fire hazards. They actually explode with heat and, and they aren't, um, I don't even think that they are. Um, no, they're not native. They're from they're Australia. Native. Exactly. So who thought of that? <laughs> um, actually, the uh, ranchos, the people that built Rancho Santa Fe, they thought they were going to use them for railroad ties. And uh, so they planted all over the place eucalyptus, and it turned out that they're, they, they are terrible for railroad ties because they're too, too hard. Dave, they're also dangerous. They're extremely yeah. dangerous. Yeah. So, so, so I, I'm, I'm going to insert here a, a little bit of a follow-up question and then go on to people's questions. Um, Ken Olson is with us, and Ken, I found to be, his situation was one of the more per perplexing on council that we have faced. And for me, it really, I had to look hard, and there was an example of um, lemon gum trees, which is a type of eucalyptus that in fact um, is less fl flammable, so it's a different strain, and it smells quite nice. And yet uh, Ken Olson's eucalyptus technically fit within the letter of the law. So I looked at um, his trees and saw that they were DRB approved back in the 80s. So when we have something that is DRB approved back in the 80s, I'll, I'll pose this to Dave, um, you know, what do we do? You, know, you were recused on that particular issue, but I'm curious how, what thought process you would bring to the table. Well, it, it, actually, I'm not going to comment on it because <laughs> okay. Ken does have a lawsuit going against the city at this point. Oh, so I think, okay. I well, think it's in best, that case, I retract the question. I think it's best if we All not right. comment on this at this point. So. I could. I could attribute it to shake roofs in the in the eighties. You know, those were proved too, but shake roofs yeah. are no good either. Right. Okay, so let's go on to the next question. Um, Steve Tarkington is asking the question: How do Dave and Tracy think the Shores property should be used? Go ahead, Tracy. Well, I think the Shores property needs to be developed from the intention that it wanted to be, which is a park with open space. I know that a lot of people gave a lot of their uh, hard-earned money to donate to that. So I think um, there should be some concrete plans. And when the money's available, as we recover from COVID, I think that should be high priority. I also think in the meantime that the city should not ignore it and they should pay attention to it. It's really an eyesore. I believe it should be maintained um, in the meantime. Um, but I think it should be a priority and I think it should move forward with the open space that the, the people who contributed to that visualize it as being. Great. So Dave, so, you're, you recuse yourself. I'm, on I'm recused, but, I, but I surely can opine on it any, anytime I want. Yeah. Um, you know, I, because I live within 500 feet, I, I cannot uh, vote on any of these issues. The Shores property was built, you know, it was purchased to be open space in the Wentz School. Um, and I think it's very important that that continue on. There should not be housing on there um, unless Community Connections and Del Mar Foundation want to want to give up their space. And I don't think we want to give the space up for Del Mar Community Connections, especially because that's a, a very important uh, part of our community. So um, you know, I, there's a plan. You know, plan is slowly being developed on how to have what what the Shores Park should look like. We should be figuring out how to keep the Winston School around because I think it's an important part of our community. Um, I do have a, a bias on that because I was a founder of the Winston School. So, uh, you know, but yet uh, it is, you know, it's nice to have a school in, in, in town rather than having that just be totally, uh, well, turn into housing or something like that. Right. Um so, so we have a few more questions that have come in. Uh, and I'll circle back to you, Ellen. I want to get cover a few other topics. Um, so, so Laura Pierce is actually asking, what is the Shores Park? Um, and she wanted to make sure she's understanding where it is. So um, Dave, do you want to talk a little bit about why we even have the Shores Park? Well, the uh, Delmar School District used to have their office building at the uh, Shores Park, at, uh, on Ninth and just uh, west of Camino Del Mar on the south side of the street. And they decided to sell that whole, pro and they owned the whole property because that used to be the Del Mar Shores uh, School. It was the only elementary school in town at one point in, in the whole area. 
and they decided to sell that. And uh, the citizens of Del Mar, Laura DeMarco being one of those, uh, um, basically put together groups of people that would uh, basically buy that and turn that into an open space. The Winston School was a major fundraiser on that. Um, and, um, you know, so it basically borders the area from like 9th Street to 7th Street or six, uh, six and a half Street or something like that. Six and a half Street um, from Stratford Court up to Camino Del Mar. There's a little slice on Camino Del Mar that's a, that is a private office building that's not part of the, sh the park. It uh, used to be used as a ball field. The Little League used that. Um, today, mostly it's used as uh, a playground for Winston School. And it also is used as a dog park. And uh, there are plenty of people that go to that dog park on a daily basis and socialize and take their dogs and have a great time. Um, you know, the school, you know, we. Uh, uh, I think the history is that we bought that and finalized the purchase in 2008. And, uh, you know, so since then we've been trying to figure out how to develop that, not develop it, but turn that into a more usable uh, parkland. And uh, so there's been a, a group of people that have been meeting on that over the last uh, three, four years to basically figure out how to use that. And then also the city's in negotiation with the Winston School to figure out how to uh, upgrade the Winston School. And, uh, and so there's some controversy on that. I'm not gonna go into that because there's all sorts of craziness going on about that. And again, I'm recused from actually knowing what that's about. So does that answer your question, Laura? If you unmute yourself, you can add. Yes, it does, thank you. I heard Shores Project and not Shores Park, so I wasn't sure what you guys were talking about. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Uh -huh. Great. So we have a question from Timothy Mills. Timothy is asking, are Measure Q funds to be used exclusively for underground? Um, if not, why can't some of the funds be used to fix roads where residents formed assessment districts to pay for undergrounding themselves decades ago? It's an interesting concept. Dave? Yeah, it's an, it is an interesting concept, Tim. Um, you know, that's something I think we may be able to think about at this point. Um, you know, again, the, you know, the Tory Pines area did uh, assess themselves. We're not going to, you're not going to get paid back that, that's for sure. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's just too difficult to figure out how to pay that back. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I think it could be something on the docket that we could chat about. Yeah, Tracy? It's an interesting idea. Yeah, Tracy? I agree. It's, um, it's a complaint from many people that I've talked to about the road condition in town. So I'd be open-minded to that. Good idea. Yeah, great. Um, so let's circle back to Ellen O'Neill's question. Um, Tracy, you mentioned some city-owned properties when you talked about places where we could put affordable housing. And Ellen says, she points out that she read that the property where the water tanks are located was considered but we need both water tanks, don't we? So maybe you could talk about the water tanks. So if you're talking the, about the one on Zuni, um, we would need to get clarification on how that could be moved and what that impact would be. Some of the other water tanks, we weren't necessarily talking about moving them, but maybe putting a tiny house near them or a couple, which could be feasible. So um, I think there are two different things. One would be moving um, the Zuni property uh, water tank and the other one would be placing a tiny home. I just want to say that a lot of times people have this preconceived um, idea of what a tiny home is and on our task force we spent um, part of our education listening to a lecture and seeing how tiny homes have worked in many communities even throughout Southern California and then we had a tour of tiny homes to see what they actually look like and they are phenomenal. I have to say they're like original beach bungalows there's some places like on 28th Street that they would fit into the character of that street and actually would be an enhancement to that neighborhood. It's an abandoned looking lot that um, I believe it's the apartments next door have a big ugly storage unit on it. And it would really um, make that more of a community and could probably accommodate two or three tiny homes there. So my perception of tiny homes dramatically changed. That's why we were also wanting the fairgrounds again, to think about 
converting half of the RV lot um, to tiny homes on the back lot of that that could also accommodate quite a few um, residents there. So, um, so just to speak of the, uh, uh, you know, the water tanks, um, our recommendations were utilizing them in a couple of different ways. So uh, in terms of tiny homes, just come to the end of 10th Street. Um, Ocean, you know, there's five tiny homes basically at the end of 10th Street. Those were actually originally houses for the people that were working at the, uh, at the hotel, downtown hotel. Um, they were remodeled uh, probably 15 years ago or so. And uh, they were made a little bigger, but not much. Um, so, People, you know, two people, a lot of, a lot of them, uh, two, three, two, at least two people live in. It's, and they're pretty, you know, they have this unobstructed view of the, uh, of the ocean. It's pretty amazing. Well, those are some of my favorite homes in town. <laughs> Good. So, um, I think Gil Williamson had so Gil, a question. Gil, do you have a question? You, you uh, need yeah. to, uh, I've just unmuted you, so you can ask your question. Thanks, I'm unmuted now. Um, your opponents seem to uh, think that uh, meeting the state's uh, mandate for affordable housing is the same as, a, as actually providing affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I think that's the same. Tracy, go ahead. You're Miss Affordable Housing. <laughs> well, me and my, um, my partners in crime, for sure. Um, so yes, we need to, so the mandate is to, um, have opportunity for the development of affordable housing. We can't twist anyone's arm to make them do it, but the, we have to provide to the, the state that Del Mar has provided opportunity for development of affordable housing. That's correct. So, you know, obviously we want to have a diverse community here. And actually we do have a pretty diverse community. Um, if you walk down the area, um, in the South Bluff area. You know, you see lots of families that are living in apartments. And, uh, you know, again, we, we don't want to create an atmosphere that the only people that are living here are uh, retired or very wealthy people. Um, so we, we, we want to have diverse housing here. It's just that we need to be able to create it without uh, ruining and a community plan and or overdeveloping. And I think, you know, again, Tracy and her group uh, with the six housing cycle basically said that we can do it. It isn't something where you need to uh, modify the community plan and overdevelop this, the city. Having said that, Dave, and, I, and obviously I, I agree with you, but I just want to underscore how important it is, as we're learning more and more about what the state is mandating, that we validate our own city numbers, they have never been validated, and I think they're grossly overinflated. And secondly, we need to pressure, we need, we need city council liaisons who work with the fairgrounds to pressure them to help meet the mandate. We are having 2,000 of those jobs are because of what, the, what happens at the fairgrounds. And the interesting thing is those meetings are closed. There's no minutes, there's no agenda. We get, you know, as task force people, we weren't um, updated on anything that happens at those meetings. And so I think the fairgrounds needs to pull their fair share. Um, now they might be more um, amenable to that as they too are having some financial crises. So some affordable housing development, which is very, very doable on that land. Um, might be more feasible at this time. But I think that's imperative that that happens and strong liaisons work with them. Um, they've gone through some new leadership changes right now, so that might be another contributing factor why it might be more feasible. But again, we need to challenge our own numbers in this city. They are not validated, and I think that they are really inflated. And I, I always say that in any work, whether you work in finance or you, whether you work in medicine or where you work in academia, you cannot accept false data. So we need to validate it. I feel very strongly about that. Thank you, Tracy. Um, so do we have others who would like to ask a question? You can wave your hand or say hello. 
Laura, with Laura DeMarco, let's hear your question. Actually, I was just going to ask Dave and Tracy, um, the, uh, it, it seems like residential zoning is not just the uh, end, it's the beginning of a lot of processes that include potentially waiving height limits, DRB review, FAR, there's a lot of things that can change with just three votes. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, and the potential residential addition will be in the central commercial zone that impacts everyone on the hill and their views straight through to the ocean, um, as well as uh, the professional commercial zone, the north commercial zone, uh, the hotel specific plan zone, uh, and the plaza specific plan zone. So the entire commercial corridor um, is potentially going to be upgraded, upgraded to residential, which is not bad in and of itself, except the fact that, uh, for example, the uh, Planning Commission just approved adding a, the Stein property at 1616 Camino del Mar into the hotel specific plan, but unilaterally waived the height limit <laughs> and increased the FAR and, and uh, the density just so they could get affordable housing there. So could you comment on your commitment to make sure that everyone's, uh, that this all goes to the DRB and that our views won't be blocked and this is an end run around Prop J that was defeated by the voters? So I'll, I'll just start with that, Laura, because I would like to thank you for that question. But, but that is one of the main reasons I decided to run for city council is because I wanna be a protector of this community and the character of the community. There are some people, I believe, that particularly three other candidates, if they get elected, they are much more pro-development. Um, I fought hard to um, defeat Marisol, and I joined Dave's team in that. And it's not that I'm anti-development, but I am anti-massive development, and there were a lot of things wrong with that development. Um, there was so much that, that was a mystery of what it was going to be. Uh, it was massive and it was on our fragile bluffs. But having said that, yes, it, the, the people on the council are going to be the gatekeepers of this community character. And that's extremely important. So, um, so thank you for bringing that up. So um, right now, Terry and I are not allowing the North Commercial to be rezoned residential. Um, you know, even though I agree that it should be residential, it the problem is is if I vote for that and allow it to be res, you know rezoned residential, that takes a four fifths vote. But to change the density, to change the height limit, to change the uh, FAR lot coverage, etc., that just takes a majority vote. And uh, I will be on the losing stick of that at this point. Terry and I would be on the losing stick. Um, so, you know, we have to, you know, we can't rezone, you know, we can't change the zone to be more residential um, and then allow a majority of people on the council to turn around and say, well, you know, we're gonna change the height limitation um, on the west side to be uh, 26 feet we're going, or whatever, I mean, let's, let's say, you know, we'll change it to be much bigger so that it all's like Stratford Square, or we're gonna change the height limit on the east side to be larger and, and change the lot coverage. Currently, the FAR is about 45 to 55%. Um, you know, they could change it to 75%. And that just takes a majority vote. And that's why, again, you know, when Tracy started, you know, she, began the conversations, he said, this is an extremely important election. And the uh, three people we know are all set to change the, the, uh, the zoning to be residential, to change the FAR, the lot coverage, uh, the height limits, all to, to allow for more types of major development. And if those three people are elected, I mean, there's just no stopping them. And that's why, again, it's extremely important that Tracy and I get on the council so that we can uh, ensure that the city is not overdeveloped. Great, thank you. Some new questions have come in. Um, I'll give a quick overview so we know what's coming down the lane here. Um, Deborah Lawson 
Cleveland is going to be asking about your solution for short-term rentals in lieu of 728. Ellen O'Neill would like to learn more about what the fairgrounds has done so far about using your land and is curious about the RV park idea. And then um, Jean is asking, can Del Mar somehow stop the building of the train fence? So let's go to Deborah's question. What is your solution for short-term rentals in lieu of 728? Oh, let me, let me start on that. Basically, um, we need to negotiate with the, with the Coastal Commission. Um, there is a tradition of running houses out in uh, Del Mar during the summer for vacation rentals and, and race rentals, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know what the number is, uh, there, you know, but there's gotta be something that we can do that's somewhere between 28-7 and what the Coastal Commission wants, which is 100 days with a three-day minimum. And there's some, you know, those, that's the, that's the important thing. But the more important thing, I think, in some ways, is we need to be able to regulate them. And we need to be able to do it proactively. So once we have the, uh, the Coastal Commission blessing, shall we say, for whatever we want, then we need to proactively make sure that people are not breaking the rules. We don't want it to be where neighbors are complain, have to complain and, and basically uh, only do it based upon neighbor complaint because lots of times neighbors don't feel comfortable about complaining. So uh, we need to, uh, we have a community, basically community enforcement that does uh, parking enforcement. They also do some enforcement of, of minor uh, rules they could be going out and, and looking to see how things are done. We can be using software to ensure that people are not breaking the rules in terms of the regulations. And, um, you know, we, we should be able to, to ensure that the, ultimately that the residential character of Del Mar does not change. And that's what we want to make sure of. Great. Tracy? Well, I agree with everything Dave said, but you know, I have some of my neighbors who are supporting me, but still are very worried about short-term rentals. And I understand that. Um, they also think that it can affect housing stock. Right now, the registered or the known short-term rentals is about 1%. So it's not a, a huge amount. However, it can really change your life if you have a rowdy group next to you and people transitioning all the time, that's for sure. So I was involved in, up in Mammoth where I have a rental when they wanted to allow short-term rentals in the townhouse complex. And it was very emotional, those that were adamantly against it and those that were very um, pro. And what we worked through was really interesting because it works. So the, the regulations that Dave was talking about, right now we have no regulations in town. There, there's no oversight in that. But what we did in, in the community in Mammoth was we came up with some really, really strict guidelines. How many people could be in each unit based on bedrooms? Uh, only one animal per unit. How many cars could be per unit? What time people could check in, um, et cetera. And if they violated any of the rules two times, they lost their permit to rent for three years. So there was really a price to pay for that. Um, and I think that that could be done here in Del Mar, for sure. There should be a list. The other thing that we have is that somebody has to be in town to respond to, um, to any complaints. And I think people that rent them, I think uh, responsibly would embrace that. And I think it should, there should also be a list in the unit of, um, of where to call if there's an issue. Um, so I think it's a really important for regulations um, and then if there's repeat offenders, then they should be taken out of the rental pool. Um, and, and again, as Dave says, we need to work with the Coastal Commission so we know what that number is. So there are a couple of um, follow-up questions that people have asked related to short-term rentals, so I'll pose them here. Laura DeMarco asks, you know, what are the consequences of having sued the Coastal Commission, you know, including how much has it cost so far? So um, it's somewhere more than $100,000 we have spent. Um, I've seen a figure of $180,000 that we spent. It's a little difficult to believe. 
Um, but there was another suit that was brought by the uh, Del Mar Alliance for Village and Beach Access. Or, um, and we lost that suit also. And that was not a cheap lawsuit either. And to uh, part of the what, what we have to do, the settlement of that lawsuit is to do a uh, environmental impact study of what it is it would take to uh, what, to regulate short term rentals. And we need to do that first. Um, you know, we lost the lawsuit against the, the uh, w against the Coastal Commission. And we lost it on a technicality, obviously, because the uh, per the application had expired. But uh, up front, I, I talked about how it's very rare that anybody has won a lawsuit against the Coastal Commission. The courts are going to be very partial to the mandate of the Coastal Commission that they continue to allow for beach access. And that's their mandate. And part of beach access is having the ability to rent short, you know, to rent houses at the beach and actually throughout town because our whole city is in the coastal, is in the coastal zone. And uh, it's very difficult, you know, I think it's extremely difficult to uh, win a lawsuit. The other way I look at this is, you know, I, I'm a technology business person and uh, there's plenty of times where my partner and I have said, well, let's go sue them. You know, let's go sue IBM. They're, they screwed us over, let's go sue them. And it's like, well, do we really wanna sue somebody that has um, attorneys that are on staff that are just being paid to defend against lawsuits? Um, I, I also um, give the analogy of, would you play chess against somebody that sits at the board seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And then you come in once a week and you make your move, you leave, and then that their, your opponent sits there for the next seven days trying to figure out what his, his or her next move should be. I mean, you just don't, you don't wanna be up against that type of stuff. It makes no sense. It's a real waste of money. And, you know, again, we need to be a friend of the Coastal Commission because the Coastal Commission is, you know, basically has us over a, a barrel on managed retreat. Um, they may cave with NCTD in terms of the bluffs, and we need to be able to work with them and make sure that we are uh, partners with them rather than fighting them all the time. Thank you, Dave. Um, Jeff Lehman uh, remarks that there are a number of similar coastal cities um, like San Luis Obispo that restrict short-term rentals to primary residences. This has worked well there. Um, will that work here? Tracy, is this something that you've thought about? I haven't really thought about it. I don't know what the, the legal um, standpoint of that would be. Dave, do you know if the Coastal Commission has a point of view of that? I don't know exactly what the Coastal Commission has said about that. Um, you know, I know that's one of the things that San Diego is looking at, the primary residents. Um, it's, it, again, when we go to the Coastal Commission, we need to have a full blown plan. Um, all we did this last time was go and say 28 seven and you could, and the residential commercial area can run out uh, 365 days out of the year. We need to have a full blown plan in terms of you know, again, whether it's primary residence, um, what the uh, what the effect is of the housing stock, what we're going to do about home sharing, et cetera. It's, uh, you know, we can't go with just a half plan. Great. So, so Timothy Mills has rejoined us. I'll ask his question. Are there, is there anything that can be done to force helicopters, he puts force in quotes, um, to navigate further offshore? Um, is this issue on your, on your radar, is it a priority for you? Um, and what's your view compared to other candidates? Interesting, uh, this was a question that was asked by the League of Women Voters Forum, and I think it took most of us by surprise. Um, I find them a nuisance, loud, frequent, early morning, and late in the, at night. I'm also concerned, I live more on the hill looking down to the beach, but I'm concerned about how low they fly. It seems like that's a really potential safety risk. 
So I don't, I think we need to figure out who these helicopters belong to. Um, some think they're all military. They are not all military because they look very different. So they're not uniform in that. Um, and then, and then talk to those different agencies to see why they're choosing to fly so low and so close to the, the coast and even late, late at night, 11, 12 at night. And it's not infrequent. And this, you know, I've lived here since 2012. This is a change. So something has changed. And I think we need to figure it out because it is a nuisance. Great. Dave? Um, the only helicopters that we have some say over are the marine helicopters that go from uh, Miramar to Pendleton. Um, you know, we did sue the Marines years ago, and we did win that lawsuit. Uh, the reason we law won that lawsuit is because they had uh, not done their environmental impact study right. And as to, to settle that, they agreed to move the helicopters off the coast a little bit further and lower so that the cone of the, uh, of the noise would uh, hit the shore rather than the, than the, uh, than the houses. Um, you know, we, we do have, you know, one of the things that I think the city can look at, because this is getting to be terrible, is to have some type of complaint line so that we can know when the helicopters are coming, people can complain, we can start collecting data on that, and then we can start talking to the FAA or something like that. The FAA is not going to regulate it, but we should be able to know who, who's flying these helicopters when they're coming and see if there's anything that we can do to talk to the people that are running the helicopters to get them off and out, out of our, our neighborhood. Thank you. Um, Surin has joined us um, with video. He's, he's been here the whole time, but would like to ask a question, Surin. Thank you, thank you. This is great, Carrie, you're doing a great job. This is a wonderful <laughs> opportunity. Thank you all for joining us. I have a question. Uh, my question is that I'm going to assume that both Tracy and Dave are going to be elected on the, to the city council. So I'd like to ask them how they feel about having their spouse serve on quasi-judicial entities, more specifically Design Review Board, Planning Commission, and Finance Committee. Uh, in other words, how do you feel about the nepotism? Well, sir, and you know that I brought that in front of the council, and I think, you know, I've always been very worried uh, about having a concentration of power um, with any group, any small group of people or any family or something like that. I think it's absolutely essential that the uh, council spouses, significant others or whatever, not be on the DRB, not be on the planning commission, and or also, um, you know, two, two significant others or spouses be on the same, same committee. Um, the, uh, it's, it's extremely important to me. And I know that uh, my opponents, um, you know, and other people on the council are mad at me for bringing that up. Um, and uh, I just think, you know, it's a, also it's a matter of trust. Um, it's extremely important that the community trust the council, the DRB, and the planning commission, ensuring that um, there isn't some type of concentration of power. And that's why I'm been for, you know, we have been consistently against that. And, uh, you know, normally the community has, you know, most of the members of the council and uh, and the community have understood that that is just not something that people should be doing and they wait their turn and uh, now a group of people don't believe that that's okay they believe it's okay and i think if tracy and i are on the council that's one of the things that tracy terry and i will make sure that there's a council policy that says there is that that's the policy of the, of the council great tracy yeah, I don't have a lot to add. I mean, I, I think at best it's suspicious and, and at worst it's, you know, conspiring. So I think it's, um, it should never happen. I don't think it should have come to that. I think that people who were in those positions should know better. But since they didn't, and it could happen in the future, there has to be a policy to protect that in the future, for sure. 
Great. So we have a few more questions. Um, Ellen O'Neill um, circles back to the, um, let's see, to the affordable housing. And she's asking, what discussions has the city had with the fairgrounds and state so far about using their land for housing? Um, not including the recent talk about homeless housing. So just set that aside. And um, she also wants to know, this will be from Tracy, why did the task force believe that the RV park w could give the city space for housing? So the first question is, um, I'm glad you asked that because it gives me the opportunity to vent a little bit. Um, I don't, nobody knows what the two liaisons who work with the fairgrounds know um, have proposed or have learned from the board regarding what their intentions are for helping us out on affordable housing due to their 2000 jobs um, that were assigned to us. It's a mystery. We've, I've asked um, and I was told that, um, that, that we couldn't go to a meeting. I asked if, there, if we could see the agenda and was told no and I asked if we could see minutes and I was told no. So I have no idea. I don't know if Dave and Terry know any different, but as a task force person, those questions were asked by me and my other um, members, and that was the answer we got. So there's no transparency on that at all, and I don't understand why. Um, so why would that work on the RV park? I think because uh, it's available land, tiny homes are unique, and that would be a great place to put them, uh, and you could create um, a really charming community in the art in the backside of the RV park. So that was one idea that I think could um, probably produce 20 to 28 homes just in that area alone. Again, it would take the fairgrounds meeting us halfway as well on many of the things that we put forth in in our recommendations. Um, so I have chatted with uh, Tony Atkins and uh, Todd, Todd Gloria, who Todd Gloria is our state assembly member and Tony Atkins, our state senator, about this and basically, you know, implored them to the concept that uh, the state has created this mandate. There's a state property that's sitting there um, and does provide housing. It is an adequate housing, but it is, does provide housing. And the state has mandated it, so therefore the state should help us out. And they, they agree. Uh, Deanna Spain, who is, uh, I've chatted with her also, Deanna Spain is the legislative assistant to Tony Atkins, very powerful woman in, uh, and obviously Tony Atkins is very powerful, and Deanna Spain's been around this, this block a whole lot of times. And uh, they're in total agreement with this. And uh, now that I think the management has changed at the fairgrounds, it will, uh, it may free that up. The other thing is, I mean, there, there's a little bit of difficulty about that RV park because that is not part of Del Mar. And for us to, uh, to, get, uh, to, to get credit for that, the city of San Diego would have to give it up. And, um, you know, so what I've been imploring um, the people that are working on this issue, uh, it has been Dwight and Ellie, go talk to Barbara Bree. I mean, she's the one that would have to give it up in some ways. And if, um, you know, although we do provide the services to them, the water and sewer does come from Del Mar. Um, if they gave that up, they'd have to give up a little bit of property tax or whatever. Um, I know they don't want to give up the hotel the TOT, the sales tax from Denny's and the, TO, and the uh, sales tax from the uh, gas station. And uh, so it's a, it's a little more tricky to, to talk about that it's RV park. It's all north of that property though. Yeah, it's all north. And, and the question would be whether or not the, uh, it would be turned into all of Del Mar or something like that. So it's a, it's a little bit more complicated issue. The fairgrounds on the uh, west side of Jimmy Durante is all Del Mar. So that's where we really want to start working with that. It also should be noted um, that the fairgrounds has several hundred units right now on the fairgrounds. They don't meet the complete criteria, needs a bathroom, needs a kitchen. Um, but one of the things that actually Lord DeMarco educated um, us on um, is that 
um, the reason some of those don't have kitchens is because of the fire risk. And so would it be plausible to get um, you know, a writer on that because they, they have communal kitchens, but be able to um, fix up those housing that are there so they could accommodate and count as affordable housing for their workers on the fairgrounds. So, and this is actually where uh, solar power comes in perfectly and it could all be electrified and there's no gas or anything like that happening. Yeah. They could have electric stoves and electric, uh, um, electric heaters, et cetera. And obviously there's some fire danger, but a less, little less fire danger with electricity versus uh, gas. Yes, and I think the workers would appreciate it too. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, you know, there are RVs that are sitting there also. So yeah. obviously those RVs have probably on propane or something like that. And, you know, so it isn't probably as safe as everybody makes it out to be. Great. Our next question is a point of clarification uh, about 728 and 3100. Um, this person has heard from some of the other candidates that in defending 728, they've said that the 3100 amounts to renting a place for three days at a time and doing that 100 days a year. Um, is that correct? That is absolutely correct. It would be basically a person could rent their house out for, let's say, 33 times a year. Um, and that, you know, in three days, I mean, the normal house rental in Del Mar is probably between five and seven days. It may even be up to 14 days. Um, and, uh, you know, I would agree that three 100 is, 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 um, very liberal in terms of what uh, the traditional Del Mar has been. It, you know, I do, again, I don't know what the number is. 28.7 isn't correct. 100 slash three is not correct. But there's something that we can do to make sure that we honor the tradition of Del Mar, that we do not allow um, the residential area to become hotels and uh, satisfy the Coastal Commission. Yeah, I think you've, you've, you've hit the important thing there. The 3100, just to clarify, is a total rental time of 100 days a year with three days minimum. So you mentioned the number 33 there, and that would be doing the math with that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tracy, did you have anything to add to? No. Great. So we have another question from Jean. Can Del Mar somehow stop the building of the train fence? Dave, you have been battling this battle for us for a long time. And it looks like we're up against our very next battle. But well, you're in and you're helping. Well, basically, you know, I'm working, trying to work with uh, NCTD to ensure that uh, that fence does not get built. Um, one of the things that's happening is they're going through some design of more bluff stabilization as that bus stabilization uh, part of the mitigation is that we need to ensure that we have access to the beach across the bluff. And, um, you know, that's gotta be part of the, the building of, of the rest of the stabilization projects. Um, until we have that access, um, fencing the bluff off isn't gonna make sense. The question would also be whether that fence really provides anybody any safety. Um, Obviously, uh, people love to cross the, you know, love to cross the tracks to get to the beach. Um, I, Alan, Steve, you you live next to the uh, the uh, large, you know, the, the most crossed area in all of San Diego County is 11th Street, and uh, you know you can't you can't stop people from crossing that. At one point, actually, uh, the bluffs bluff did. Uh, slough off, I think it was in the uh, late 90s, and they put a fence up, and that fence came down almost immediately. It was incredible how quickly the surfers took it down. Um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna figure out how to, how to get NCTD to back off and, and uh, ensure that we continue to have good access to the beach. Um, so I know Jean has another question, so, but we're coming up on the very, very end here of our hour and a half. So Jean, is it a quick question? Yeah, Dave, are they using federal funds to build that fence or are they using, what kind of funds are they using to build a fence? And I'll-, I'll, we I'll are, there, There's no funding for the fence right now. All right, thank you. Great. 
So, um, so, so we've asked all the questions, I think, that people have put into the chat room and all the people who have wanted to ask, you know, the, uh, I don't see anybody else raising their hand. So, so Tracy, what I wanted to turn to here was just a congratulation on the Run Women Run endorsement. And you gave such a great closing statement for the Run Women Run group. And I was wondering if maybe you'd share a little bit about what Run Women Run means to you and what you said to them. Well, I mean, Run Women Run is, uh, was really important for me to get endorsed by them. They're uh, an organization, nonpartisan organization that promotes uh, women to run for a political office. Um, they also offer education and support and training and mentoring. So um, they kind of, it was kind of late in, in the whole campaign. So I only had an interview about a little over a week ago and then found out um, this morning that I was endorsed. So I'm very pleased to, to get that endorsement. So, so Dave, um, let's turn to you. Do you have some closing words as we wind up this evening tonight? Well, first of all, I appreciate uh, everybody showing up. Um, some of the, you know, I know most of the people, but some of the, some of the people on the uh, call I've never met. And I really appreciate uh, you showing up and, and listening to uh, what Tracy and I have to say. Um, I'm very pleased to be running with Tracy. Um, She's the only one, other woman that's, she's the only woman that's running on the, on, for the council. And uh, again, I think that's very important that we have a balanced council, that it is not just all men. Um, the other comment I would make is uh, we don't want a whole lot of lawyers on the council. And uh, two, two of the people that are running, Bob Gans and Glenn Warren, are, are attorneys. And uh, attorneys, I, you know, I've served with attorneys and it's tough because they uh, lots of times want to talk about the legal and not the empathetic things that needs to get done. And uh, I think it's very important to have people that listen, that, uh, that listen to the people as they're coming up and uh, to the dais or sending in letters or, or making comments and not just having a prepared speech um, as, you, as you enter the, the council chambers. So I'm excited. Uh, again, to have Tracy working with me. I'm excited to be working with Terry. And, uh, you know, I'd really appreciate if, and be honored if you would all support us and, and vote for Tracy and I. Um, well, you're going to get your ballots October 5th or so. And uh, as they say in Chicago, ver vote early, vote often. <laughs> but ex especially vote early. Um, you're going to be able to drop your uh, ballot off at the library. Whenever the library is open, you can drop your ballot off as soon as at start, starting October 5th. And uh, the polling place is going to be the Del Mar Highlands. Um, that's the only place you'll be able to vote. That's going to be open, though, October 3rd to November 3rd. And, um, you know, but uh, obviously you want to get your ballot in quickly so that it's counted. And we all we know on election night who's won rather than waiting until November, the end of November. So Great. again, really appreciate everybody showing up. And, and oh, I think uh, we have one more. Do we have one more question from the Dolans? Oh, hi, Terry and uh, Dave. Sorry to interrupt. And but I wanted to say that uh, we joined tonight. Uh, I've known Dave a long time, and uh, we worked together in uh, city council uh, uh, engagements. Um, and so we were here to learn more about Tracy. And I have to say that uh, uh, we we've, we've been amazed and. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope, I don't know who all here is still left here. Maybe everyone's a proponent, but uh, for those of you who aren't a proponent, um, I would like to uh, offer our encouragement and uh, support for Tracy. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, much Mike. I, I enjoyed working with you on uh, the Communications Advisory Technical Committee. Great. So the very last question, Tracy, was what can we do to help the campaign? People would like to know what else they can do. We just got 3,000 door hangers delivered today. We need walkers if you want to help us deliver that. Um, no, I just was, first of all, I want to thank you, Mike, for the, the kind words. And I, I also want to thank Terry and Dave. I, you know, have listened to council meetings for a long time. And um, I had a living room meeting with my neighbors. Um, for Terry when she was running, I didn't know who she was. And I 
um, quickly supported her. But it means a lot to me to be endorsed by um, you, Terry, and, and Dave, and to put your trust in me. It's a big responsibility, and I don't take it lightly, that's for sure. But I do love this city very much, and I want to fight very hard for it. Um, you know, I, I, and speaking of empathy, Dave, I am a registered nurse, and we're known to be empathetic. We're known to be good listeners. Um, and so uh, I think it's time we have a nurse uh, on the council. Um, you know, I'm new to politics. I'm not new to leadership. I have been uh, the chair of the Traffic and Parking Committee and vice chair of the Ad Hoc Housing Committee, um, along with two other amazing women. Um, and I've also been the president of both national and international medical societies for integrative health practitioners. Um, so I, I think I'm fairly good listener. I'm a consensus builder. And I think it's important to know that if I were to be lucky enough to be elected, I will always listen to all sides. I will not show up to a council meeting already knowing the decision or the vote I'm going to cast. And I think that's really important. So, um, with that, I uh, would be honored to earn your vote. And um, also, if you have other questions to reach out to me by my phone number that Terry provided, I think on the screen, um, and also uh, by email. And then you can learn more about me um, at tracyfordelmar.com as well. So Mike, to answer your Terry's question, um, you know, we would love to have people endorse us. Um, we're going to be sending out a mailer soon with all the people that do endorse us. And uh, we'd love to have your names on that. Um, the next thing is to put a sign up in your yard and we have plenty of signs so that we could get those signs in your yard. Um, and finally, if you uh, feel uh, generous, you can contribute to our campaign. And uh, you, if you can, you can email me or, or Tracy or Terry or and we can send you an URL um, where you can donate online or you can send your checks. <laughs> you know, I'm, so, I'm not, I'm not going to give you much more of that, but uh, obviously those are the three things that we need to have at this point. That's all right. Thanks for the uh, heavy sell there and uh, please yeah. send us all the information. I will, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> and Great. We'll at least get some signs in the yard and uh, and uh, we'll, of course, support you in, uh, in the ballot. And it, this was a really great evening for us. Uh, you know, we, we, I know, I've known you for a long time, Dave, but I uh, really didn't know Tracy at all. And uh, I don't know Terry all that well either. But um, anyway, I look forward to it. And uh, gosh, I hope you guys are uh, elected and win. Thank you. Really appreciate the support, Mike. Uh, thank you, Mike, very much. So, so as moderator, I'll, I'll just say a couple closing words. Thank you so much to everybody who participated and listened in today. Thank you for being here. Um, we've given you some information on how to learn more. Um, Tracy and Dave are ready to work for you. So please vote, vote early. And the ballots will arrive the week of October 5th. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Have a good evening. Thanks a lot. Just about. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was Everybody's really left. People. Wow, Tracy. <laughs> that was excellent. You did a great job, Tracy, as usual. <laughs>